face. I ended up ripping my shirt off or pulled my shirt off my back and I was going to use that to cover my mouth and my nose and keep running. Um, but when I pulled it inside out, it was completely full of bees. And at that point, I just couldn't run anymore. I just had no, no more muscle. So I ended up getting on my knees and my elbows, like, you know, crouched down. And I took my hands and just covered my mouth and covered my nose. I was spitting bees out of my mouth and blowing them out of my nose while this was going on. I was just burning up. And my thoughts were my family. I just wanted to stay alive. I was praying, you know. Moser was stung over 4,000 times, and the levels of venom in his system were so high that his organs began to shut down. And I think at that point is when I started losing consciousness. When Moser's condition deteriorated, he was airlifted from Las Vegas to Phoenix, where specialists could treat him. I woke up in the emergency room with six doctors pulling stingers out of me. It was just frightening. The main thing that kept going through my head was my family. And that was the hardest. I didn't want to die. And as you could tell, it still bugs me. Um, I just didn't want to, I didn't want to go out that way. In addition to their attacks on humans, these giant swarms of killer bees have almost completely wiped out the honey bee in the southwest United States. Experts estimate that there are five million killer bee hives in Arizona alone. Each giant hive containing up to 80,000 bees. And now it appears these killer bees may be headed even further north and adapting to colder temperatures. But some scientists, like Dr. Marla Spivak, believe giant killer bees aren't a serious problem and feel the threat is exaggerated. The African bees are not really a problem in the southern United States. They've disrupted beekeeping a little bit, so some beekeepers that were used to keeping very gentle colonies of bees have had to either stop beekeeping or adapt to keeping a more defensive kind of honey bee. On a windswept plateau, a young wolf battles for survival. He is Black Wolf, a two-year-old loner who recently broke from his pack. No wolf wants to be alone. It's too hard to make a living without allies. But Black Wolf is willing to take the risk for a higher status, a better territory, and a chance to breed. The urge to be with his own kind drives him onward. Until he stands before a new valley ruled by a mighty pack. Their presence draws him closer. But this is dangerous ground. Here, Conflict is a way of life. High rank and breeding rights are often achieved through force. Many die young. But he is no ordinary wolf. Instead of strength and aggression, he's armed with cunning. And he brings his own recipe for success. His entire young life has led to this moment. It all began two years earlier and many kilometers away in Yellowstone's thermal caldera. Little is known of Black Wolf's early life. Knowledge of other Yellowstone wolves can paint a broad picture. Like all wolves, he was born within a family unit, a pack. In this pack, a white female is the reigning matriarch. Her daughter is a subordinate and Black Wolf's mother. At two months, the youngsters enjoy a pampered life. 
the adults constantly feed, groom, and generally fuss over them. His grandfather, the pack's alpha male, takes charge of today's food delivery. He won't allow other adults to eat until the little wolf gets his fill. Young pups are exempt from the hierarchy of adult society. Their job is to eat and play. But they develop a pecking order of their own. Black Wolf usually ends up on the bottom. His brothers and sisters practice the dominance they'll use later in life. But aggression and exploring the riverbank beside the den. Right now, this is his entire world. But there's plenty for a curious pup to discover. Beyond the safety of the den, Yellowstone is a more dangerous place. Black Wolf's grandfather must face the hazards if he's to feed his pack. Wolves are hunters, but when he finds an elk carcass, he turns scavenger. Problem is, he's not alone. The ready meal attracts a mother grizzly bear. The wolf protests, but there's little he can do against 130 kilos of muscle and thick hide. But even a bear must be careful. The smell of blood seems to drive bison into a defensive display. They turn their aggression on both predators. Finally, the grizzly has had enough. She rejoins her waiting cubs to look for an easier meal. In this game of round robin, perseverance pays off. The young ones are blissfully unaware of the effort it takes to feed them. They're putting on about one and a half kilos a week, eating nearly every day. By mid-October, Black Wolf tops 20 kilograms. He and his brothers and sisters are nearly full-grown and able to keep pace with the adults. Now he can begin a critical stage in his education. His first lesson in hunting. In the fall, Yellowstone's elk herds migrate from the mountainsides to lower valleys. The wolves know where to find them. The alpha male leads the charge, and the other adults synchronize their attack. A few steps behind, the youngsters watch and learn. With adults to teach him, and a stable pack in which to grow, Black Wolf is on his way to becoming a hunter. But his small pack is vulnerable. He is the first to notice a strong scent. The smell of other wolves. His grandparents know all too well what it means. Invaders. A rival clan from the south has slipped into their territory. They're a large pack of tough bison hunters, and they're looking to grab this land by intimidation or by force. As 
his first winter arrives, Black Wolf's world is under siege. His family challenges the intruders. But their howls betray the small size of the pack. The invaders know they have the advantage. And they charge. Their mission is to destroy the heart of the small pack by killing its leaders. Black Wolf's grandfather, the Alpha Male, is their first target. The pup is too young to intervene. He can only flee as the mob catches up with the Alpha and kills him on the spot. The family's one hope is escape. Black Wolf's mother gathers the young ones and leads them over a ridge to safety. They wait for grandmother, the matriarch, to catch up. But she too will not be coming. The white female fought to guard her homeland and protect her family. She is mortally wounded and stays in her territory to the end. Black Wolf, his mother and three siblings are cut adrift. They have lost their leaders, providers and teachers. His mother cannot hunt and care for all the young on her own. Wolves routinely go several days without food. After two weeks, the pangs of hunger grow more intense. There is prey in this new territory. Black wolves. If there's a time to step up, it's now. Black Wolf draws on his powerful instinct for the chase. He tries to tap into what he's learned. But the prey seems to sense his inexperience. He can't put the pieces together, and his hunger only grows. At every turn, the quest for food is a failure. Even the ravens don't put much stock in Black Wolf's chances. They often follow wolves on a hunt, looking for scraps. Rarely do they return the favor. But a gathering of birds nearby catches his eye, and his nose guides him to the strong scent of carrion. An old elk has died. Yellowstone's harsh winter has taken one life and saved another.
the windfall feeds the entire pack. But such lucky finds are few and far between. To survive, they need to hunt. And to hunt, Black Wolf needs more training. What he really needs is a father figure. Each day, Black Pup's mother sends up a message. She is in estrus, and her need to mate is nearly as strong as her will to survive. Her howls identify her as an available female. They read like a beacon to any solitary male. But no one answers her call. For two more weeks, she tries to scavenge enough food for the ragtag family. But the job is too big for her alone. Winter blows icier than ever, taking a toll on all who dwell in Yellowstone. Until one January morning, a distant sound drifts in on the cold air. A young male wolf wanders into the neighborhood. He's a disperser. A wolf out on his The young mother eagerly responds. And an exchange of calls guides him to her. brand new wolf pack forms in Yellowstone. The new stepdad proves to be a solid provider. The pack is safe from starvation. Black Wolf is a yearling now. It's time to share the burden of bringing food for the family. He must become an elk hunter. One morning, his stepfather leads him and his brother to a nearby pond. A small group of cow elk have come to drink. Black Wolf eagerly launches the chase. But as before, the prey fights back. A kick from an elk can break a wolf's jaw. But now, his stepfather is by his side. The yearling rallies, and together they charge back. Where one wolf fails, two succeed. Finally, brother charges in to help finish the job. Black Wolf is a hunter now. Yet, in the moment of triumph, this successful partnership is about to be broken. At the end of his second year, he feels an irresistible calling. 
The urge to mate pulls him away from his family. To answer the call, he must leave. He begins to wander to the edges of his home territory for days, then weeks. Until one day, he doesn't turn back. He steps into the unknown as a lone wolf. Most young males choose to disperse like this, but it's tough going. Food is harder to catch and keep. Large prey is too formidable. He needs to think smaller. Much smaller. Thieves dog his every step. No morsel is too meager for a coyote to steal. But they underestimate his determination. They can hassle and taunt, but they can't shake his focus. Black Wolf gets his rodent. But the coyotes get the last word. He endures this vagabond life for one reason. Find a mate and end the solitude. Black Wolf calls out and listens for a reply. There's something in the distance. A sound, but not a wolf. Something strange and frightening and getting closer. In an instant, the sky unleashes chaos, a deafening roar and blinding snow. Then, a sharp sting he slips into darkness. Four hours later, Black Wolf emerges from his encounter with man. He is now a tagged and collared animal. Yellowstone Wolf number 302. Like so many of his fellow wolves, he will be monitored by humans. Now, his movements and behavior will be well documented. The ordeal does not deter him long. He pushes north until he stands before a broad valley. The place seems to... And they do. One of Yellowstone's largest wolf packs rules this valley. The Druid Peak Pack, 17 wolves strong. He's an outsider here, an enemy, 
Strolling into their territory is asking to be attacked. But something tells him to stick around a while. A pretty face can have that effect. She's one of the young druid females, and her demeanor seems friendly. Downright enthusiastic is more like it. For him, it's a tug of war between attraction and fear. There's good reason to be wary. Her father is the druid leader, a powerful alpha male called 21. Black Wolf tries to play it subtle. If only she'd stop bouncing around. Too late. Alpha males kill intruders like him. This is a life or death decision. Black Wolf must either run for his life or turn and face his attacker in a head-on challenge. But given two options, he picks a third. He faces his rival, then immediately surrenders. <laughs> the charm offensive fails. Now he's in trouble. In his panic, he runs straight for the park road. A bad idea. More than a dozen Yellowstone wolves have died in traffic. Most won't go near it. But that is his saving grace. The road is like a force field. It stops the attacker in his tracks. Black Wolf is safe for the moment. So he decides to hang around a while. He flits about the Alpha's charcoal gray daughter. And every other female within earshot. When 21 catches him, he runs back to the road. This behavior is hardly typical of a male wolf. Challengers like him usually fight for dominance or move on. But there's a method to Black Wolf's madness that could indicate a clever breeding strategy. The Druid pack has many females. But 21, the Druid Alpha, can't mate with them because they're his relatives, mostly daughters. That's not to say he doesn't try once in a while. But when he does, he gets an earful. It's how wolves avoid inbreeding. So when a dark, handsome, and very available stranger shows up, what's a young wolf to do? For the rest of 2003, Black Wolf blossoms into his new role as Casanova, wooing females from his base of operations on the park road. The charcoal female especially finds him irresistible. Pretty soon, she's spending more time with him and less with her father's pack. Typically, a couple like this forms a pair bond and starts its own pack.
But it turns out Black Wolf is not a one-woman guy. He seems content to stay right where he is, cavorting with multiple druid females and mating with them on the sly, but bonding with none. He passes another year without commitment, free of any responsibility. Eventually, such behavior has consequences. In 2003, Black Wolf becomes a father. On spring days, when the coast is clear, he sneaks into the druid den to visit his pups. He's pulling off a unique balancing act. He's not a pack member, but he's not really an outsider either. Perhaps he's just biding his time, sensing an impending opportunity. The druid alphas, 21 and his mate, are both old wolves. In early 2004, the alpha female dies. A few months later, 21 himself climbs a high ridgeline and disappears. His seven-year reign, one of the longest in Yellowstone history, is over. The loss leaves the Druids reeling and desperate for a leader. Some even abandon the pack. This could finally be Black Not Wolf's so mast. A new candidate saunters into the valley. Another dark stranger, and he intends to rule the druid pack himself. The newcomer to the valley is no stranger. He's actually Black Wolf's younger brother, a male called 480. Black Wolf seems like a shoe-in for the alpha spot. But he's made a habit of doing the opposite of what's expected. He puts up no challenge and lets his brother 480 take over as Alpha. After all, he's done just fine without being in charge. Why change now? He'll stay focused on the females and let his brother make decisions, protect the pack, and lead them on the hunt. With 480 in charge, the Druid Peak pack begins to recover. But the stability is brief. Without warning, an army pours into the valley. A surprise attack. A new enemy from the north has been steadily growing in numbers. Now, it's one of Yellowstone's biggest and most aggressive packs. They want to expand their territory by conquering the Druids. For the second time in his life, Black Wolf is on the losing side, outnumbered and on the run. As the Druids flee, he falls back on old instincts. He makes a beeline for the park road, his sanctuary. Behind him, the victorious Northern Pack celebrates its conquest. The Valley of the Druids is theirs. In crisis, wolves sometimes abandon their pack. 
A fresh start could be waiting for Black Wolf just over the next hill. But instead, the former the Rambler side. picks up the scent. It is a bleak time. Disease sweeps through Yellowstone. In 2005, no druid pups survive. Under the strain, the pack fragments. The once mighty druid clan dwindles to just four wolves. Black Wolf, the Alpha 480, and two females. Together, the four wolves survive to greet another spring. This year, fortunes turn. Two litters of pups are born. Black Wolf is likely the father of some. The eight little ones evade disease. They grow into the new foot soldiers of the Druid pack. After two years in exile, the Druids are eager to take back what is theirs. Now, they are an army 12 wolves strong. Near the end of 2006, they launch their counterattack. They catch some of the northern pack by surprise as they feed on a kill. Black Wolf is in the thick of the fray. By day's end, the richest hunting grounds in Yellowstone belong to the Druids once again. Black Wolf is now six years old, a tough animal and the druid's best hunter. He scores kill after kill for his pack. By now, he provides for the family as much as any Alpha. He should be settling into his golden years as a pack elder. But new problems keep turning up. On the fringes of Druid territory, history is repeating itself. With a twist. A young crooner has appeared. And he's romancing the druid females. It's the Alpha's job to kick out intruders. But 480 is not on the case. He doesn't seem to care what his daughters get up to. Black Wolf, on the other hand, definitely minds. A sneaky tryst with the Alpha's daughter is his trick. No young upstart is going to beat him at his own game. Black Wolf brings all his power to bear on the intruder. He's built like a tank. But the spry Don Juan is a slippery opponent, running circles around his aging rival. It's like he's using pages out of Black Wolf's old playbook. Clearly, 
other males can pull off the Casanova strategy as well as he can. If the old wolf is going to do the work of an alpha, he should at least get the benefits. But no, he still has to endure life as a subordinate. 480 never misses a chance to remind him who's boss. It could be that Black Wolf has finally outgrown the druids. In the fall of 2008, the elderly eight-year-old abandons the pack he worked so hard to join. It's a bold move that's usually reserved for wolves a quarter his age, journeying into a new territory, looking for a mate. But this time, he's not alone. He actually tags along with five dispersing young males, his bachelor gang heads west, roaming boldly through territory claimed by other packs. Until they come to a high... The land is free, with no resident pack. There is plentiful game here. And above all, a female wolf with two young companions. With seven youngsters hanging around, the two adults court and forge a pair bond. Almost by default, Black Wolf becomes the alpha male of his own pack at last. Yellowstone wolves seldom live past five. Black Wolf is nearly ten. He has lived through war, exile, and famine. He has hunted elk by the hundreds. Few wolves can match his experience. The younger ones may be faster and better at the chase. The old wolf arrives late to the sea but he still has the muscle to deal a finishing blow to a bull elk. Under his steady leadership, the new pack thrives. After years shirking responsibility and breaking rules, Black Wolf now keeps order within his pack. And after years as an opportunist, who perfected the art of mating on the sly, now he enforces his sole right to breed. It has been a long journey from renegade to alpha. In early October 2009, he sets out to patrol his territory. He never returns. He probably clashed with enemy wolves and died defending his pack's home. He lived longer than almost any wolf in Yellowstone by avoiding such conflict. He likely sired more offspring than any other male, nearly all of them in secret. A strategy he didn't invent, but may have perfected. Just before the end, he witnessed the birth of one final litter, the only pups he ever fathered as an alpha male. In Yellowstone, the Blacktail Plateau Pack lives on, and with it, the legacy of Black Wolf.